Recovery Sort Of is a podcast where we discuss recovery topics from the perspective of people living in long-term recovery. This podcast does not intend to represent the views of any particular group, organization, or fellowship. The attitudes expressed are solely the opinion of its contributors. Be advised, there may be strong language or topics of an adult nature. Sort of. I am Jason, the guy who practices recovery. And I'm Billy. I'm a person in long-term recovery. I'm Caroline. I'm also a person in long-term recovery. And we're going to talk about practices that have kept us in recovery, right? We were thinking of this idea, like what are the most important few key elements that have... I, I don't even know how to encapsulate this, Billy. Maybe you can help me. Is it like that supported our recovery or like the three main things we we wouldn't have stayed in recovery if we wouldn't have done? Or like, how are you thinking about this? So, yeah, I was thinking of it as like the, the things that are foundational to our recovery, like top okay. three mm-hmm. or whatever. That's kind of how I was thinking of it when you said it. What and about you? I took a little bit of a different perspective. I kind of was thinking about the things that maybe are like the less traditional things, but what really helped me um, in early recovery to to stick and stay, I think, were the were the things that I was thinking of. Mm. And maybe kind of taking like the like things that are a little less obvious too. Yeah, it's probably um, different early recovery compared to now. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, and that's where my brain was like racking itself trying to figure out like is this like was there one most important thing that I couldn't have lived without the first eight years that maybe I don't need anymore, but I still want to include it in my top because I wouldn't have got here without it, or mm. do I just want to include the three that are right now? And I was like, ah, oh, yeah, man. yeah, I didn't wow, think I of that. All and this like shit my out. couple now, like the meditation and exercise, I didn't start doing those until I had, you know, right. almost twenty years clean. So, right. So they weren't foundational to the beginning because I didn't fucking do them. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mine. My, the couple of things that came to mind for me um, are definitely not things that I necessarily need to do or work on today, but they're mm. what got me here, right? right? Like they're what gave me a lot of these things that I'm going to talk about are the things that gave me um, the ability to build the foundation that that I live on today. When so. When you say they're not things that you have to work on today, is that because... They're just not things that come up for you anymore, or are they things that you have worked on and practiced so much that they're like second nature now, so you don't have to do them anymore? I think there's a little bit of that, but like, okay, so for example, one of them, like I remember in early recovery telling myself, I'll get high tomorrow. Hmm. Hmm. That was like my coping mechanism to just not, like the literal just for today was like, I'll get high tomorrow. And as long as it was always tomorrow, it was never happening, Right. you know? Um, So I don't have to do that now, thank God, because I don't want to get high. Like, I don't have to, like, (laughs) trick myself into, like, (laughs) not using, you know? That was my coping strategy while I was using. I was like, yeah, I'll get clean tomorrow. Yeah, exactly, (laughs) exactly, (laughs) exactly. Right, this is perfect. I'll I'll just never get clean. Jane's addiction. Yeah, going to kick tomorrow. (laughs) That's right. Um, So I... It's it's really tricky, and I don't even know if I have necessarily a list of three. And, and really more of what happened for me was just trying to think through this. I was like, I think trying to talk through this is going to be enough of a conversation in its own. Because the first thing that came up for me was like, okay, what's the most important piece of my recovery? And, and stay in, you know, focus to a life of like, I, and this is where, I, how do you even define recovery? Like what is right, and that's a life of that's what? Evolved too. Because I yeah. don't want to say a life of like, growth because that i mean yeah kind of life of growth i guess that doesn't put any expectations that it's not okay right now also but i don't want to be like oh a life of getting better because well i would think if you say you are recovering you have to identify what you think your problem is Hmm. you know what i mean like you can't i don't i don't know how you recover from what you don't know that you have like recover from the first 40 years of life (laughs) (laughs) it's been rough well well, and that's where these different fellowships come in i mean when you look at a fellowship like you know aca or adult children of alcoholics and dysfunctional families like that's what they think they're recovering from is the dysfunction of their upbringing which is very different from alcoholics anonymous or narcotics anonymous where we identify as drugs specifically like that's what i in that if when i'm in that okay. fellowship i'm identifying drugs as my problem or addiction right. i should say not drugs, right, right but i got you. right 
or sexing out, you know. So maybe, oh God, this is, might take us way the fuck off. But <laughs> is that still what you're recovering from now? Mine, I believe so. Okay. So I, and that's what Addiction. I was thinking. Like abstinence is a main tenant of my recovery. Okay. What I believe I'm recovering from. So that's interesting because with abstinence being the main tenant of your recovery, it does almost sound like you're recovering from drugs as opposed to recovering from addiction. Uh, you know what well, I mean? It's a part of it. Yeah. 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 I'm not, not trying to get picky thing. with yeah, it, right. but I was like, I was like, huh, that actually sounds more like the drug piece than the, the addiction piece as we, as it gets talked about in the 12 step. Well, right. that for me is the most clear and damaging addiction part, addiction part. I yeah. Gotcha. The obsession okay. and compulsive to you so that's I like mean, number one <laughs> yeah i mean we were just talking a little earlier and it's like the idea like i had a friend of mine share with me recently that he's not in recovery anymore and he's gonna smoke weed and it's been a couple people in my life and immediately i go to like yeah i want to get high and then that turns into i want to get high all the time every day like mm. that's just that's where my head immediately goes and i don't know if i would do that or not right. but that's where my thinking goes <laughs> immediately right, like i want right. to be high all the time huh. <laughs> like, and that's, that's where I think the obsession and compulsive comes in. Right. You know, I didn't I don't know that I'm using to escape something as much as I just like being fucked up. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think when we talk about recovering from addiction, at least for those of us who have been in 12 step for some significant amount of time, we've been taught that like a court you can't recover from addiction if you are actively using like right. that is a basis of of at least the N.A., and I'd say a programs. Um, so like if you're identifying your problem as addiction, I think it goes hand in hand if you're still in that frame of mind. Makes that, sense. That you can't you can't fix it if you're still doing that. But but I guess that's the part that always gets me back into the circle of like, okay, I understand that and that makes total sense. But everything I did for the first at least 10 years of recovery, if not maybe everything that I'm still doing now, is some version of this obsessive and compulsive, compulsive relationship with something. Gambling, shopping, sex, women, new relationships, like anything, right? They're, they're all there. So if I'm still participating in some version of the addictive behavior or patterns or cycles, why is that any different and say, and I get it, maybe it clouds your head, but I don't know because when I go to these other programs, they say, hey, sex addiction and food addiction produce the same exact chemical stuff in your head as, as drug addiction does when you use it. So to me, it's like we're saying, hey, you can't recover if you're still doing these practices with drugs. But yeah, sure, you can still work these steps if you're doing these practices with something else. And I'm like, I don't know. Your head's just as cloudy either way in my mind. Yeah, I mean, are you using those things compulsively? Yes. I mean, I would say that for the majority of my recovery, I haven't. That's awesome. I mean, yeah, I definitely I mean, haven't. Yeah, I yeah. I mean, I, I know that happens. I just that hasn't been my experience, so I right. don't know. I definitely can admit that I struggled with food for for a couple of years, kind of starting in 2019, 2020. Um, and someone could argue that I was using that compulsively and it was impacting my life. I mean, you can, you can look back at the videos from two years ago and see, see right. the impact, the visual impact on, on, uh, on myself. But, um, yeah, aside from that, I mean, you brought up new relationships. We all know that I'm in a new relationship. I wouldn't say that I, I think there's a certain amount of like, um, neurotransmitters that happen when you're in a new relationship and that's like fresh and exciting but like I don't feel like I actively like feed into that to try to accomplish that more if anything that scared me I mean I think I was talking about with you like in the very early days of of this relationship there was like alarm bells going off for mm -hmm. me just because of the intensity of feelings mm -hmm. and like this like learnt this almost this training that I've gotten in recovery of like intense feelings are bad. Like things that make me feel different are bad because I don't want to find myself in a situation where I'm using things outside of myself to change the way I feel. And I know you're going to argue that that's all we do all day, but like, that's absolutely the basis of life. <laughs> but I do think there's a big difference between something like that and being on crystal meth. Like there well, is a definite brain impairment that comes along in decision making when you're on crystal meth when you're on alcohol i mean 
Well, you know, I, I say the consequences of what you're talking about. Absolutely. Like the decisions we make on drugs in no, an altered state. No, but I mean, if you state. compare a drunk person to a person that's in a sex addiction and then you, I don't know, ask them 10 questions, like the answers that you'll get from the drunk person might make no, like their brain is chemically impaired. Like they are, right. they are impaired to the point that their decision making is now questionable <laughs> I, I feel like it's intensity can... levels though I, I feel like that's true for all of these but yes i will i will definitely yeah. default to drugs probably do that much more intensely than yeah. the other versions for sure but like with what caroline's story she just told there was alarm bells going off in my mind alarm bells are alerts get out stop yeah, do well, something else but the euphoria of the feelings kept her there anyway no, right I mean, alarm but, bells but i'll stay but but that would <laughs> be like saying, you can't like, fall in love with anyone though it is was that what that means? I mean, well, those, that's, what those alarm about uh, alarm, that's what those alarm bells were for me. The intensity of like falling for someone felt scary. But And oh. isn't that what drugs and addiction do, though? They hijack our natural systems and then throw them into like overdrive. Like they sort of hijack our, what do they call it, like endocrine system, not endocrine system, our rewards system, and then be like, Hey, get rewards from all this fake shit that isn't really real. <laughs> like, whereas those other, like the more natural processes of like love, and again, anything too obsessive becomes a problem. But like when we fall in love, the whole point of that is our bodies want us to reproduce and have offspring. And so we become attracted to people of the opposite sex. And that's a whole natural process that happens. But addictions to chemicals and substances sort of hijack that system and be like, get these same rewards, but from basically bullshit, from something that's not real, from something that doesn't matter and probably doesn't have a lot of benefit. Gives you the rewards, mm -hmm. but you're not going to get the payoff of reproducing to have more offspring. Like, For the sake of getting us back on topic, I'm not going to reply to that. <laughs> Because I, I disagree. I don't okay. think what Caroline had was love. I think that early stuff is infatuation. Love is like a lasting, oh, yeah, lifelong a kind of thing. Yeah, and yeah, I yeah. think infatuation is right up there with making us make bad decisions alongside mm, Well, that's drugs, probably, personally. yes. I would agree with that. So I, I don't know. I don't, <laughs> yeah. I don't think that means you can't fall in love. I think that means infatuation is a very, very powerful it thing. It is, that but I think you. it's inevitable when you're falling for someone. Like, I don't think there's, I don't think... I mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe, but I feel like infatuation is the first steps towards, oh, I really like this person, you know, like that is that feeling. Well, then there's definitely other factors that come in there, too, because you figure a, I'm going to say reasonably mentally healthy person that hasn't grown up in like an abusive household, like they could be infatuated with somebody, but I think if the person starts beating them up or, or physical abuse or sexual abuse, they would probably still leave if they have you know, like a healthy upbringing and they're not used to being around abuse and shit like that red flag would be like, whoa, I'm out like I can't even though I'm infatuated with this person, I'm not going to stay with somebody that abuses me. Mm -hmm. But so I do think there are some environmental factors that play into our addictions in all, for, you know, in all forms. I mean, I don't think really healthy people become addicted to drugs like I just I don't. <laughs> mm -hmm. I feel like there's there's a component too when we talk about like using things outside of ourselves and what that threshold is because i know you argue that everything we're doing is a form of using things outside of ourselves to change the way we feel but i think is it changing who we are right because when i think back about like when i think you know and i've had this conversation recently so oh, it man, comes to dave? mind but <laughs> what where's dave with the who we are question because oh, he was just here last time uh, talking about yeah episode, yeah yeah but um like i think about who like matt when he was caught up like mm -hmm. that was not who he like like drugs were literally changing him into a person that he's not and i think it does that for a lot of us and i think sex addiction can do that too like if you see someone who's really caught up in sex addiction if you see someone who's really caught up in sex addiction you're gonna see a lot of them you're gonna see behaviors bad behaviors that are changing like they them participating in things that they would not do if they were not caught up in in that addictive behavior. Yeah. Whereas, like some of the other things, same like with food addiction. Do you really think it's different with? That's the whole point of the addiction is that we're doing stuff that ain't us, and it doesn't yeah, feel like good. Smoking like, doesn't seem to change people no. as much as say alcoholism. And I would say catch food them on addiction. day three without a cigarette. <laughs> See what you think then. Well, when they're uh, stopping, yeah. yeah. 
I but I don't. So, I still don't think it's the same. Well, though. but anytime they're in a situation where they can't, like, oh, I'm now in a three-hour work portion of my day where I can't go have that cigarette by and hour, I hour. Be a little testy, but I'm not right. All, but they're like going to be totally different. different person. Right. I get you, and yeah, I I don't disagree about the intensity levels. I just think I'm not going to steal my mom's bank card. Right, <laughs> right. right. I, I might for a tasty cake. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And again, same with the food addiction. It's like, yeah, you might be like eating more than you would if you weren't caught up in that sugar craving cycle. But I'm not like a totally different person. And but I do think the emotional part's the same. Yeah, I, I guess for me, I don't know, maybe. And, and I'm not trying to like live this perfect life or do it without fault or anything. But I just want to also not be ignoring the places in my life and how this impacts me, even when it's not the same intensity level. So, okay, I, I'm not using the drugs. I'm not homeless. I'm not screwing over my family. That's wonderful. But am I in my house on my phone or my Xbox all day and not paying attention to my family? Because maybe that's no fucking different. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to miss that the, the toys I buy and shop for and the stuff that I bring into my house also takes my attention away from the people I love. And like, I see that now in w different ways and, and how is that impacting me and how is my new relationship maybe having me give less care to my dogs or how, you know what I mean? Like, less and care I'm, to the podcast. I, right, <laughs> right. You know, those things happen. Like these things change us to be different people like you just explained and like I just witnessed that sort of in you. Now, granted, did you steal from me or anything to go get more drugs? No, you didn't. But like it. It's still a thing that comes between our ability to get closer and connect. You know what I mean? And I think that's the importance circling back, <laughs> circling all the way back yeah, to identifying back. what do I think the problem is and right. what is it that I need to, what am I trying to recover from? Right. Like, right. Am I trying to recover from, you know, in my case, maybe just a super shitty bad upbringing and my drug addiction was a result of that? Or do I think my drug addiction is something else yeah. because. You know, I can go to, let's say, you know, the adult children of alcoholics and dysfunctional families if I think it my problem is just my poor upbringing and lack of coping skills right. and then maybe be able to use successfully. Mm -hmm. But if I think my problem is addiction, then I'm going to treat that differently and have a different mm -hmm. set of parameters for what I'm doing. So did you, Caroline, did you tell us what you thought you were recovering from? I think, I know Billy said addiction. Addiction. Was his. You think addiction yeah. too? I mean, I think addiction with the core of it being probably some genetics, but a, a large amount of it is my upbringing and, and trauma. I think that's the basis of my addiction. Okay. I don't know that I ever will feel Ooh. like I can get as healthy as I want to get can get willing to do the work to get um, from my background, from my upbringing, from my trauma. I don't know that that ever means I can use successfully. And I am at this point in my life, not willing to take the risk to find out. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always going to be, there's always going to be that like addiction and abstinence piece for me, as long as I'm in the frame of mind that I'm in today. So I 100% agree with what you just said, then, Billy. That's probably what the difference in what we're trying to talk about right now. Because I don't think addiction is what I'm trying to recover from at this point. I think I'm, I don't know if I'm trying to encapsulate it as like recovering from childhood trauma, recovering from just fucking life, <laughs> or if it's like right. that's kind of half of it. And the other half of it is that this was always meant to be our challenge or journey in life. Almost like we're kind of born with this is the thing you have to find a way to be okay with. Like we each have our own little thing. And I don't know if that's born with it or if it comes from our childhood experience, probably more comes from our childhood experience, but that's what I think I'm trying to recover from this idea of like, I'm trying to make peace with this challenge I was given personally. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Makes hmm. sense. So I, the first one I came to when I was trying to think through is like, what's the most important thing in my recovery? What keeps me here? What keeps me feeling like I'm growing and moving forward? And, and the idea of self-care came up. But then I was like, I feel like that's all-encompassing and going to encompass everybody's <laughs> answers all together. Like everything we do, right, for us is self-care. Like is there an answer on your list that's not self-care, Caroline? Yeah, I mean, the <laughs> like there? I'm going to use tomorrow is not really – I wouldn't call that self-care. I would call that like a like a, like a, like a tricking my brain. Totally I mean. compassionate. It's you saying, I can't stand this suffering, in my mind, right? It's you saying, I can't stand this suffering, and then another piece of you saying, hey, 
it's okay. We'll, we'll take care of it tomorrow. Just get through today. Just be okay right now. We'll address all that tomorrow. Okay. Can you make it through today? Cool. That feels compassionate to me. Yeah. I mean, at, at the point where I was using that as a coping mechanism, it, it, I didn't have any of that. I'm sure right. you weren't giving it to yourself right. like that, but right. I think it's still the same yeah. the same idea, right? Yeah, I guess and I think I guess it depends on how broadly you define self-care too because I hear self-care and I tend to think like exercise, eating healthy, getting enough sleep. Um, yeah. You know, like hmm. honoring my needs if I'm feeling really tired, not forcing myself to, you know, do 18 loads of laundry that day. Like just that kind of thing more so than like I feel like using, giving myself permission to tomorrow. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's I funny you reminded me of this, and I, I never really thought of it that way, but I used to tell myself early in recovery, like, I'm going to give this a year. I'm going to mm. give one year. I'm going to be fully in, fully committed. I'm going to be the best, you know, recovering <laughs> NA person. Right. I can do everything they fucking tell me to do, and then we'll see what happens. Hmm. That was kind of a big thing in the beginning. And my perfectionism attitude of like i gotta be the perfect na member like i gotta have service commitments and be in my home group every week and like i can't miss a day (laughs) all that shit my character defects played an important role in my commitment to recovery one of of billy's top three is his character defects (laughs) (laughs) that's what kept him here more than anything else i'll show them motherfuckers (laughs) i'll be better than you (laughs) right that's so funny because i can remember thinking being so frustrated and upset that like there was people and and look this is coming from like 30 60 90 days clean a warped (laughs) brain like take it with a grain of salt i always feel guilty saying it i'm like god this makes me look bad but i would be sitting there and like miserable that other people that i thought i already had a better grasp of recovery at had more time than me and then i could never fix that (laughs) (laughs) and i but but the thing that kept me was yeah, but nobody after me is going to ever get more than me, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I will just keep, like, I'm not going to let anybody else do this to me. It was almost like they, like I felt like a personal attack, like that they had got here first or something. <laughs> it was like, nobody else is going to get me like that. Like, what the, that's kind of crazy, but it, I guess it helped. This is way off track, but I, I just, I would think the same thing about, like, people that would ask other people to sponsor. I'm like, why the fuck are you asking me to sponsor you? Like, you're going to ask that guy? Like, look at him. <laughs> Good luck with I that, I thought we buddy. were hitting it off. I thought things were going going well right, like right. you know it's, it's like getting chosen <laughs> this might choose another uh partner right, you know right. what i mean I, but our first three dates went so good i'm in the friend zone like shit right. <laughs> <laughs> oh literally God. that's that's hilarious Billy. <laughs> so is that was that the top thing on your list like number one was that no. the, what was well, the number I don't, one i mean i didn't order didn't them intentionally order. i wrote yeah. them down as i thought of them so my first one that i wrote down was gratitude and we talked about this on the gratitude episode. I feel like that's been like a core tenant of my recovery since very early on. That like idea of a grateful addict will never use hmm. and trying to remain grateful and and look at like the the positive things that I had in my life. Which again in early recovery was very easy because I was homeless very recently before getting clean. So just having like a bed with clean sheets to sleep in was was something to be grateful for Mm. um so yeah that that one was like my quote-unquote top of the list i feel like this goes back into my argument against stuff because like we get the stuff and it all gets in the way of just having the gratitude because the less what i'm noticing for me now maybe this wasn't possible then and maybe it's not possible for anybody i don't fucking know but i go in my backyard and i practice not just meditating but like i'll try to sit out there for an hour or two and not pick up my phone not do anything just kind of sit so don't get me wrong i'm not alone the whole time sometimes some of my kids will wander out talk to me for 10 or 15 minutes go back in um, but I'm just, you know, I'm listening to the birds. I'm watching the breeze. I'm feeling the breeze, watching the breeze on the trees. I'm not crazy. Um, <laughs> I'm feeling the breeze. I'm, I'm feeling the sunshine. I'm, I'm watching my chickens and my goat and just chilling, right? You have a goat now? Yeah, we just got a goat. It's pretty <gasps> cool. Can I come meet your goat? Sure, absolutely. Um, Is it a little goat or a big goat? It's supposedly a pygmy, but it's not the tiny pygmies. It's like a American pygmy, which is like mid-size, don't I guess. do you need a but, second goat? I don't know. I feel like if you have one goat, you need two goats because they need a friend. Okay. Well, 
we'll talk about this yeah. another time. So, yeah. <laughs> so I go out there, and the more I'm moving away from these distractions, right, which to me, like stuff I'm just noticing is more and more of a distraction, the more I am grateful for the feeling of the warm sun on my skin and the, the nice little cool breeze because it's been like 68 around here and like, you know, the birds chirping are really pretty and it's like watching some of the birds fly through. Like I am being more and more grateful the more I'm moving away from all the bullshit I put in front of that. And I just, I don't know if that could have happened earlier or if the stuff was a replacement for, for feeling better, but I don't know. I will say this when you I said the thing about the bed and you said stuff it wasn't my bed I will point out it belonged to the recovery house so that's <laughs> well not. like even <laughs> even now like I'm more inclined to notice when the sheets get changed and they're nice and clean and fresh right like that I, I get in it and I'm like oh awesome. this is gratitude I feel it right you know what I mean so it might not have been my bed but just the fact that maybe I had the sheets or whatever like and again this gets way off what we're talking about but that I think that is all still stuff like the sheets it and is. the bed and all that. But, like, but I'm like, grateful okay, for the... Okay, they live out in the woods in a tree fort and sleep on the ground. And then right. maybe that bed and the house and the stuff seems really important. <laughs> like, yeah. you know. Well, and that's... Right. That's exactly what I was saying, though. Like, I was living out, um, not in a tree fort, literally. But it, it's all about the frame of reference. It's harder to be grateful for the bed today when I have a bed... Right, and then and I've had a bed, bed for a while, and you know, and then I have a bed in my RV, and then I have <laughs> right. beds in hotels I yeah. sleep at. Like you know, like it just, but but the but as I grow, I can be grateful for other things, right? The ability to have an RV, the ability to travel, the bil- ability to um, pay my bills. Well, you know, like yeah, that, and I mean, there's... I'm not disagreeing with those. I'm sorry, I'm cutting you off. Go ahead. No, I just I think that, you know, like it, it, it broadens. And so that's why it's been so important to me, because like I said, in in the beginning, it was very easy because I was coming from a place of like utter desperation. I had nothing. I had no relationships. I think that was another one that maybe wasn't stuff in the beginning, but the ability to have my parents trust me again hmm. um, was was a big one for me. Um, the ability to like have things to do on a friday night that wasn't just trying to find one more you know like there was a lot of stuff it wasn't all material um the material stuff as they've been easier to accomplish maybe become lower on the list um but continuing to prioritize having a list even if it's like a figurative list i think has been a continuous theme throughout my recovery i guess what i was trying to think through with that statement was if we didn't continue to accumulate and bombard ourselves with more and new stuff, would we still be able to more readily be gra- grateful for the, the smaller things? Like if I didn't accumulate the 300,000 things I've bought since I, I showed up in Narcotics Anonymous and decided to try recovery, would the bed still feel more relevant and grateful? And, and that's I think so, because I think the less distractions I have, the more I'm able to appreciate the few things that are in front of me. It's just my take. I can't prove it by the science but that's what i was i guess asking yeah. like, do we move away from some of that early gratitude as we continue to just give ourselves so much more I think as humans we acclimate you know as humans we we take for granted that's like just basic human nature like when you're used to ha- you get used to having something and then it doesn't matter as much unless you make a conscious and intentional effort to have it continue to matter um so this brings me to one of my most important things, meditation, yeah. God damn yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've got to get in here because I don't know if it's the practice of, you know, like I was just theorizing. Well, if I didn't buy all this stuff, maybe I'd appreciate the few things I had more. But the the act of meditation and the practice of like going out back and being intentional and mindful and like that has really started to shift my ways of looking at things and the ways I feel inside about my life. Um, so yeah, I can't say enough about meditation. Uh, that would be like the one I want to bring up now in response to gratitude. Like meditation has increased my gratitude. It has increased my love. It has helped me get more in touch with these things. Um, 
I know Billy is probably got meditation on his list. It, it, my current list, yes, but early in recovery, oh, yeah, it was yeah. not, you know, and and it didn't get on my list, even though you would hear it all the time and it sounds good and and I would, you know, quote unquote, try to meditate mm-hmm. and think that I was supposed to be quieting my brain and I just didn't have a proper understanding of the purpose of meditation. But nowadays, right. yes, it's incredibly important. Um, it's key to just my overall well-being in general like it's like you know for me it comes into almost like brushing my teeth like Mm -hmm. it's just something that i feel like i need to do on a regular Mm -hmm. basis and when i don't i start to notice that i'm not Mm -hmm. usually in behaviors you know i become more reactive i Mm -hmm. become more less tolerant and patient you know Mm -hmm. and unfortunately what usually happens is i notice those things first and then i go oh well shit i've kind of not been meditating (laughs) as much lately like i've been blowing it off in the morning or whatever so that that is a huge one for me do you meditate caroline i mean i'm so i've been attending the dharma recovery meeting um fairly regularly that's cool um here over the last couple of months and so there you know that meeting starts every week with a meditation of some sort it Mm. varies um from week to week so i'm participating in that um but no aside from that i've not been that's cool though yeah. I, I haven't I still haven't made it to the recovery dharma <laughs> meeting. I want to. Um yeah, I don't I, I can't say enough about it. And I know we've said this exact thing on the podcast before, the idea that meditation is a word in step eleven. And like those list of steps is in almost every meeting I've been to, posted <laughs> on a wall or read aloud or both, or and yet I don't feel like it's talked about in the program very often. And I don't think it's very, I don't want to say enforced, but like suggested as strongly or as often or as frequently as some of the other practices we do. And I feel like it, I wish I wouldn't have missed out on doing it for the first, I don't know, 10 or 12 years of recovery because it's become such a foundational piece of what helps me today and what gets me where I need to be on a daily basis that I just can't imagine life without it. Yeah, and it's almost one of those things where I I think it takes some, like, patience and really, I don't know, surrender to do it regularly because you don't get an, like, you or I don't know, you might get an immediate benefit, but you don't necessarily notice an mm-hmm. immediate benefit. Mm-hmm. So it's like you meditate and you go, okay, well, I still feel the fucking same, mm-hmm. even though I just wasted 20 minutes of my time doing quote unquote nothing. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And so what's the point? Like, is there really a point to this? And <laughs> it, unless you have enough faith to stick with it and be like, yes, I believe that something is going to happen or there is some benefit to this, you know, you don't stick with it. I mean, right. would you do things regularly that don't benefit you (laughs) well yeah that are inconvenient (laughs) right right so and and that's weird for me i don't know that i knew this earlier on in meditating but now like i will i will be feeling a miserable feeling like one of those just down bad feelings that i'm like i just don't know what the fuck to even do from here i'm just gonna like tell my wife how much she sucks or i don't even know what (laughs) happens from this point and I'm like, I need to meditate. So I'll, I'll get in my posture. I'll do 25 minutes. And I know when I walk out of that, I'm going to feel better somehow, whatever that means, right? Generally, I don't feel different feeling-wise, but the feeling doesn't seem as big or overwhelming anymore. And so, like, I know that's a go-to that I can just walk away from and I'm going to shift the way I feel over the course of 25 minutes. And like you said, like, doing that, I'm like, oh, fuck yeah, I'm definitely going to do that next time because it works. Early on, I didn't feel that relief. Like, I don't know if I felt any relief or if I could notice it, but I was doing it to try. But I feel like when it wasn't as noticeable, it was harder for me to stick to the routine as well, right? I'd do a couple weeks, miss a few days, do a couple weeks, miss a few days. And now it's a lot easier. Like, no, no, no. I want to make sure. Like, this is a really good loving practice for me. And I do feel the benefits. And I want to make sure I put it in my day. And like, I, yeah, that's a hard one. Like, Everything else I do that that easily becomes a habit or routine gives me more of that. I know I feel great afterwards. Working out, I know I feel great afterwards, right? Like when I'm hungry and I eat, I know I feel great afterwards. I'm tired and I sleep, I know I feel great yeah, afterwards. Right. Meditation, I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> well, and I think finding a practice that 
fits what you're trying to get out of meditation is important, Mm -hmm. you know, and I kind of mix mine up because there's a couple different reasons that I do it. But early on, I thought, oh, this is supposed to be like quieting the mind and I'm supposed to sit here and make myself stop thinking. Mm -hmm. And that's not at all what it is for me now. Right. Couldn't be farther from that. (laughs) And I was like, well, I can't stop my mind from thinking right. like it's fucking thinking all the time what is it? this is stupid like this is pointless <laughs> and i would try and try and i'd be like well my mind isn't quieting so this it doesn't work mm-hmm. <laughs> that perfectionism yeah i mean i think that's one of the things where like i go to the meeting and i'm willing to do it because it's part of the meeting but i don't know what the fuck i'm doing and right. i don't know if i'm doing it right and like so i just like do whatever they tell me at that particular meeting but like to try and do it on my own like i don't know what to do and i don't know how to do it properly and (laughs) and if i feel like i'm not doing it properly i'm gonna get frustrated so yeah so here's how i kind of like to think of it and it doesn't play out exactly this way because i do have some other practices but think of it as like Meditation for me is like, uh, think of kids in school and kids are in school and they're in there like learning throughout their day, right? But at some point in the day, they get like free time where they get to go outside and like just run around and be wild and kind of do whatever in general. For me, that's meditation. That's a time for me to take a break from my brain just to kind of do whatever. It can think and I don't have to react to none of it. I can think, I can worry, I can whatever, I can run 20 scenarios in my head and then when I'm done, all that shit's gone and it it's just a break from the the thoughts that go on and the what I've learned is I'm not trying to keep myself from thinking. What I'm trying to recognize is I don't have to react to none of that shit. None of it matters. It's my head running around like a chicken with its head cut off, you know, mm. doing all the crazy yeah. shit that my brain does cuz that's what a brain does. Mhm. Heart's know? beat, and, lungs breathe, brains think. Right. Right. And that I don't have to just be this reactor to whatever thoughts are going on in my head and by practicing that on a daily conscious basis, like I recognize, you know, whatever I'm worrying about, whatever I'm thinking about, when I'm planning my day out, like none of that matters. I can let all that go and just think it and then let it go and be done with it imagine if every heartbeat you had you had some kind of thought in response to it about how awful it was and how you were going to die and how this was going to go wrong because your heart beat at this moment and this way and this that and the other and then you understand why we're all fucking sick (laughs) because that's how we treat our brain as if all that stuff matters and we got to have extra thoughts and all this about it and it's interesting though like when you described your meditation i was like yeah that's not what i do at all I, i do the opposite almost and I thought you were going somewhere else with the description of the kids in school. Um, I think mine is more like the practice of noticing I'm not meditating is actually more of my meditation. It's like, oh, shit, I'm not meditating anymore. I'm I'm actually like trying to solve a problem. Come back over here. Come back over here where I'm just watching this shit. Oh, caught myself not meditating again. There we go again, right? Like it's not actually a – but I do think early on before I got into meditation – there was a couple of instances where people tried to describe it. And, and what you said, Billy, my perfectionism took over, man. I, I read a book about Zazen, which is the kind Dave practices, which is really particular form of meditation. Yeah. And it's like my thought was, yes, I have to stop my thoughts, silence my mind and sit in this perfect, elevated, straight back posture. And that is the goal. <laughs> right. And it was like beating myself for not being able to do that perfectly instead of. You know, you listen back to our episodes. We did an episode on meditation at like number three, and then we did one with Dave (laughs) later on. And in both of them, I'm like, can you lay down? (laughs) Is that a thing? I want to lay down. And and like, look, I've been laying down. It's fine. It doesn't even matter. I don't want to lay down at all. Oh, man, you can lay down. You can sit. It doesn't make a goddamn bit of difference. Like, maybe it does. I don't know. But for me, I've found both of them very useful. And, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect. And that's where, like, for me, the meditation comes in is like, like we talked about, like, I have an obsessive compulsive brain i get into something i'm curious about something and immediately it takes over you know it's like Mm -hmm. i got into doing jujitsu and then it's like oh i want to go there four nights a week and we're sitting home having dinner and everybody's talking about their day and i'm thinking about you know what i learned in class and Mm -hmm. when i can get back to class and what video i just watched and through meditation i learned hey you don't have to feed into that stuff this is your obsessive compulsive come back be present in the moment Mm -hmm. you know be be here with your family and let this shit go i don't have to stay stuck You know what I mean? In that spot of like, well, this is what my brain's thinking about. So this is what I got to do. And this is how I have to, you know, Hmm. be. It's like, nope, that's just my brain being my brain. Let's come back and be present with your kids and your family and sit here and have dinner and pay attention. Like, okay, I can do that. (laughs) Were you going to say something? No. I mean, that was interesting to me. Like, 
I, I guess my question to you would be, what if you enjoyed the mental part of he does. that? What? He does enjoy the mental part of that. Right. What do you mean? It doesn't mean it's good part for of what? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So like. Well, there's a time and a place for that. Okay. You mm-hmm. know, and sitting there at the table at dinner with my family when everybody's talking about their day. It's not the time and place. It's not that it's wrong or right or whatever. That's fine that I love this thing and want to think about it. That's great. That's just not the time that it needs to be. Or like when I'm at my job handling work, I shouldn't be obsessing about this other thing and neglecting my work. Right, right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. What's a, I don't think you've given us one off your list, even though meditation was on your list. But what's one off your list, Billy? What's weird to... now, I got probably two lists. One is like what I did oh. early in recovery and <laughs> what would be like now. Well, we'll stick with what you came up with when you were coming in. Oh, okay. The now. So now um, I think meeting attendance is important huh. for me. Okay. And not a ton of meetings, but one of the things that happens for me of going to meetings is – a connection or a reminder or a reinforcement of mm. ideas and beliefs okay. instead of me. So, and this gets back to the surrender, you know, stuff we'll talk about surrender later, but, and Caroline, when she talked about gratitude being a foundation to the beginning of her recovery, so maybe this does go back to the beginning of my recovery, was surrender. Coming in and thinking, I don't know how to run my fucking life. I have lived most of my adult life thinking, I know what's best for me. No one can help me. I'm going to do it all myself. I know what I need. And finally, that realization of I have totally fucked my life up. Mm -hmm. I don't know at all what I need. And in fact, most of what I think that I need has just got me deeper into a hole. And so for me now, like going to meetings is kind of a reminder of that. Like I am powerless over my obsessive and compulsive thinking. And that even now, even though it might not be about drugs, it can be about other things that can still cause harm in my life. Hmm. So, uh, for example, like I went to my home group the other day. I have a home group. I go there every week or pretty much every week. And so I had a situation where this friend of mine, you know, is using now. And immediately when he tells me, like, I get almost jealous like man i want to get high now like everybody Mm -hmm. else is doing it it should be fine i should be able to do that too (laughs) like i'm successful in my life and everything's good and i'm not suffering all this childhood trauma anymore and you know i should be able to manage it now and i get this jealousy and then i start thinking about it well i probably could use you know it probably wouldn't be that big a deal and blah 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 and i go to the meeting and then after the meeting nobody said anything but after the meeting is like I need to fucking call my sponsor and talk to him about this because I've learned by going to meetings that, you know, I should talk to people about the shit that goes on in my head sometimes because that shit gets me in trouble. And so I called my sponsor and we had a conversation and we talked down through that, you know, Mm -hmm. and it wasn't a matter of him saying don't do it or do it or whatever. It was a matter of like, well, what are your values? What do you think you're going to get out of it? And what are the positive and negatives and it's like all those recovery concepts mm-hmm. and i don't know if i would have done that if i didn't go to that meeting gotcha um so the meetings are a reinforcement of ideas and beliefs and practices you know that i think are critical to my life hmm. so meetings are interesting for me right now i we did that episode about mm-hmm. not going to meetings um and that's definitely where i was for um the last couple of years, just not really going yeah. to meetings or only going if there was like a specific reason to go, like showing up for someone else. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just these last few months, I have been more consistently going to meetings. Um, I've been regularly going to meetings of some variety for the last um, maybe two or three months now. Um, and I do feel like I'm starting to grow again Mm -hmm. um and it's interesting to me as billy was saying that it's almost this chicken or the egg thing is like did i feel like i came to a place where i wanted to grow and so meetings became a part of that or did i or am i going to meetings and you know what i mean like Mm -hmm. i don't know if i'm 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 not verbalizing that real well but almost like am i seeking out growth and so meetings are a component of that or am i seeking out meetings and connection and so the growth is becoming a part of that yes um yeah <laughs> You're, okay but i don't know i almost feel like it's probably the uh, my 
interpretation is it's almost the first more than the second, but I would not, I, I don't, I wouldn't be like, oh, I'm not ruling out the second. So this was interesting. I What I ended up doing, I couldn't narrow it down to a list of three. So I sat around this morning and just tried to think through what they all could be. Like, what's all of them so that I can at least have the full list and I never got around to picking Yeah, why three. does it have to be three? It doesn't. I was just thinking if we each brought three, that was probably an hour's worth of conversation. But I was like, I, I don't know how to narrow it down. Let me just see if I can conceptualize what a bunch of these are. And I came up with, you know, meetings but I also like slashed it with fellowship because I wasn't sure like was a like Billy's talking about an important part of the meeting where <clears throat> I'm reminding myself of my mission, you know, that I that I have stepped up to decide to pursue, which at that point was recovery through Narcotics Anonymous. And like every time I walked into a meeting, I heard more of that stuff. I walked out and I felt recommitted to that process. Right. Refreshed in my memory of what am I doing today? Oh, yeah, I'm supposed to be living this new life. Um, but was it that or I mean, obviously, it was partly that, and it was partly, like, the people I got to see there and seeing the same faces and making connections, and, like, I don't know if you can take those two apart to say, like, oh, the the showing up to get my recommitment to recovery was the part that I was really using, or if it was the showing up and seeing the, the familiar faces with the warm smiles, like, I don't know that you can separate them, but it, that I, was definitely a huge part of my recovery, at least at one point, you know, it's not necessarily now, even though I feel like I still pursue the the connection in a similar way, but the the reinforcement of, you know, Narcotics Anonymous necessarily ideals, I, I don't benefit from that or haven't felt like I have for a while. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and I mean, for me, like, I, NA is only a small subset of the meetings. Like, I'm, I'm not, I'm right. going occasionally to NA. Um, there is a meeting that I like, but, that I've kind of like found, oh, I like this NA meeting. I'd like to attend this one regularly, but it's on a Friday night, which is I've been traveling and mm-hmm. it just hasn't been super convenient. So, um, but I kind of, I've been, yeah, I've been picking and choosing. And I like that right now. Mm-hmm. I like that. I mean, on the one hand, I'm like, oh, I should have a home group and I should be like, you know, using a sponsor in this specific fellowship. Like I should be like doing it the way it's quote unquote written. Yeah. But like what's working for me right now is this kind of like picking and choosing. Like I like this meeting, I'm getting this there. And I like this meeting, I'm getting that there. And like, so I'm like all over the place in terms of fellowships and um, it's it's working at the moment. Um, so my, my, and that's fine. I don't want to make this sound super judgy, but it's gonna. So I'm sorry, <laughs> but and it comes into a lot of things, you know, a lot of things that people do. So everything's fine as long as everything's fine. But what do I do when shit hits the fan? So like I could say, well, I don't necessarily need a sponsor or whatever. Like I'm fine and I don't need step work or whatever else. But then what happens if something horrendous happens to my wife and kids? What happens if, you know, whatever, my work burns down and I lose my job? Like what is my reaction going to be if I don't have those pieces in place, like somebody that I call when shit's gone bad or a place that I can go to feel safe and connected and to talk about, oh, shit, my life's in chaos and now I don't know what to do. Then what do I do? And I don't know. My previous stuff is to resort to using or whatever bad coping mechanisms that I had. And if I just sort of push away or change all the currently new and what has been working coping mechanisms, what am I left with? Mm -hmm. You know, so there's a, a bit of a like if I stay connected and stay, you know, if I have a place that I go every week to talk about what's going on in my life, if I have mm. people that I talk to regularly to, you know, yeah, when everything's fucking fine, it seems kind of boring. But when shit hits the fan, what happens? And, of course, we've been through that with our kids being molested mm. and stuff like that. It's like I had a connection of people that showed up and came to court and supported us through all that. If I hadn't been going to meetings or had a connection with those people at that time, I wouldn't have like called them up out of the blue and been like, oh, hey, by the way, I know we haven't <laughs> talked in four months, but my kids just got molested. Will you be my friend? Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> like so having those things there is more of a uh, insurance policy. Know, yeah. And it's just something again, I had Was... a sponsor tell me early on in recovery. It's like we don't practice recovery for when times are good. We practice our recovery for when times are bad. <laughs> I 
I, I just wanted to clarify. Are, are you saying because Caroline said she kind of does the hodgepodge of different meetings that she wouldn't have that stable, safe like connection in the one place from going routinely? Is that like the the point you were making there? Or yeah, I guess like the not having I guess a which connections yeah, yeah, like which connections do you have or do you have people that you would feel I mean, I guess if you have people that you can talk to that you feel safe with, whether that's through therapy right, or meetings right. or a significant other, but it's like if we start getting down to like the only person that I talk to is my wife mm -hmm. and then if something happens to her, what happens? You yeah. know? Or if I don't have you know, therapy or somewhere to go right, to get right. some sort of outside help. I mean yeah, I mean, I think my experience, so I have absolutely maintained relationships over the period of time that um, that that I had pulled away. But I think if if anything, and, and granted, this is this is 18 years of training, right, where it's like when the shit hits the fan, you go to a meeting, right? But it almost was like I like that that came that came. I was in a position where I got to test that theory because I had been not going to meetings and then I got in this relationship and I started feeling all these feelings and I started seeing behaviors in myself that I didn't really like and hadn't expected to see. And so I started going to meetings <laughs> because I was like, something is not right here. Something with the way I'm feeling, behaving, being, I don't like the way I know to be better, feel better, get better is to go to meetings. And so I would say a big catalyst for me going back to meetings in in, in um over these last few months is that kind of like upheaval of my life by kind of bringing this new relationship on. But and I don't want to call it shit hitting the fan. It's not catastrophic, right? It's not losing my husband or putting my dog down or some of these other things that I've encountered in, in, in recent years. But, um, I guess I'm fortunate that I ingrained in my psyche enough is that knowledge of like, when I'm not feeling right, these are the things I do. I reach out, I go to a meeting, I ask for help. And so that's what I have been doing these last few months because I've encountered a situation that's different and feels not always super safe mm -hmm. or, you know, like my behaviors that I'm questioning, you know? So I think, I think exercise was another one that would probably be on all of our lists mm -hmm. or at least a, a, yeah. a close not, fourth or fifth. Yeah. Not, <laughs> not my, not my coming in, but yeah, uh, certainly today. Yeah, not my early. See, I feel like mine is on the whole list for sure, but for different reasons, which is fascinating to me. So like in an interesting way, looking at this has, you know, I'm always like, I worked out hard coming into recovery because one of the things I always felt terrible about that I used to cover up was how weak I was and how scared I was and how small and afraid I was for a man in our society or whatever. So a lot of my early uh, recovery definitely included like daily workouts six days a week if not more like all my diet was focused around it. I'm buying all the GNC supplements you know $500 a month or whatever and it's like that was all about looking better on the outside to feel okay enough just to stay alive, really. Mm. And I, I wouldn't look at that now and say that's necessarily, quote unquote, healthy. I mean, in the scheme of where I was at that time, that was probably the healthiest decision I had <laughs> right. on the plate. Right? right? Like it was better than going and getting high again. But I look at it now and I'm like, that just feels like another version of trying to cover up all the pain and hurt, right? Like not really address any of it. So while it was a... a an amazing behavior that, you know, probably kept me in recovery during times when I couldn't go near that pain or hurt that I had. I, I don't know that it's necessarily the greatest, whereas more like today, it's more like, hey, I want to be moving and I want to be able to move into my 80s one day if I'm still here. And I, I like my heart having a good resting heart rate like they tell me to. And that's more what it's based around now, which feels more in tune with like, hey, I actually want to be healthy and treat myself nice, not I got to cover up all this ugly shit that I got. Yeah. Well, is that like the idea of like grace is like when we get uh, good results from bad intentions? <laughs> like, is that what that is? Know, I don't know. That's the way I like to think of it. It's like 
grace, you know, right. like we just got lucky, <laughs> like, right, you know, like right. I made some decisions for the wrong reasons, but it ended up working out in my favor Well, and, and or to it, some benefit. I yeah, yeah. Yeah. To some benefit. Cause like I look at it now and I'm like, but all the heavy weight I was putting on me probably has a lot to do with how my back feels now. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, there's some, some trade off there, but right. uh, so what do you think about exercise? Like I, we do come into recovery and i think there is this introduction to the idea that like there's probably a more holistic problem going on at this point like i think that's a pretty clear thing right that we talk about mental spiritual physical and emotional you know parts of this recovery process but we don't tend to talk much about many of them outside uh, or in the program itself like right. we don't you don't go into a meeting and people are like man you guys should be on a you know exercise or routine or yeah, right you know but yeah i think that is a huge piece that that maybe or even maybe it's just taking care of our physical self in general like that's not just going to the gym but also going to the doctors regularly and getting checked up and blood work like that's another thing i feel like probably really important to taking care of ourselves yeah. and maybe it was lucky for me i didn't get into exercise and weights early on because i probably would have been in there for the mm. same reasons feeling a lot of those same things right. when i got in later when i first started exercise it was kind of that it was like oh i'm gonna get big and you go mm. in you see all these other big guys in the gym lifting heavy shit and then for me what happened was i started to fucking come home sore and like my shoulder was hurting and mm. i'm like wait a minute Let's reassess, like, let's right. look at, like, what are we doing here? What are our real intentions and motivations? How do we get that, you know? So I was able to approach it with a healthier mm -hmm. lens, a healthier view to realize that what I was doing wasn't in alignment with what my goals were. Mm -hmm. um, so I changed up the way that I exercise. And, you know, for me, it is almost, it fits in with meditation in that I have a lot of anxiety. I have a lot of, like, I just carry a lot of angst and a lot of tension. And when I'm exercising regularly, it seems to burn that off. Hmm. That's, I mean, really it just, and again, it's not like I like go in one day and exercise and then all my anxiety has gone. It doesn't really work like that. Right. It's more of a consistent effort. And like, I'll notice like there's been a couple of weeks we go on vacation or schedules get busy. I don't exercise as much. And then I can feel that. Yeah. It's like the bad things come back for me so easily. It's so easy to like blow off meditation when my schedule gets busy, blow off going to the gym when my schedule gets busy, blow off these self-care items with the justification that I'll be fine and yet I don't blow off, you know, watching a baseball game on TV or these other mm -hmm. things. It's like I immediately blow off my personal care things. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, that's you were saying the thing about like, you know, meditation makes you feel better. So you do it. Mm -hmm. I know exercise makes me feel better and I still don't want to do it a lot of times. So, yeah, I don't want to do it. Yeah. It's, and yeah, I mean, it's crazy how. I mean. It's awesome that you can say this is going to make me feel better. I'm going to do it. I wish I was well, there. It's, but I'm not. So honestly, but you're encapsulating it like there's some profound, amazing piece of me that's doing that. And I actually look at it the opposite way, that there's actually some lacking, awful piece in me that makes it that it must be that way. And I was just thinking about this when Billy was talking about it. And I was like, kind of like how... Um, Denise said on the, the sound healing episode, right? Like this idea that I've almost feel like I've been led to these growth practices more because of how fucking sick I am. <laughs> like It's yeah. more like I am so fucking dysregulated on a Monday morning, seemingly, you know, on the surface about nothing because there's nothing wrong in my life. And it right. feels so fucking terrible that it's like I'm either going to jump off the fucking Empire State Building or I'm going to lay in this bed and try to sit with this. Like, that's the only two options I got left. I can't move another step in my life. It feels so terrible. Okay. And that's where I'm like, it doesn't really feel like it's coming from a great place. It's yeah. more like, right. I got no other choices here. Yeah, I better that's do fair. This. I mean, when I feel and like I'm that, I will go. <laughs> I will go and exercise when I feel like well, that. And I feel like you pointed it out, though. And, and almost it's made me kind of rethink about this list of like, oh, well, I did this because it was the most important at that time. And I'm thinking... No, we did this because we felt so miserable we had to do something, just like you were talking about. I'm noticing this shit in myself, and I had to go back to meetings, right? It's almost like we're going to end up at this place no matter what. We can't stop it because this shit doesn't feel good now, and eventually we'll get there, but it's just a matter of time of like, 
how long of not feeling good it takes to get us to do something different. I, yeah, I and I guess for me, like, that sums up what I think I'm recovering from is, like, I have this thing inside of me that wants to be selfish and lazy and it's full of apathy and procrastination and if i give into it then that's what i do Mm -hmm. you know and that i have to like i'm in a constant battle of like trying to be the person i want to be versus that thing that's in me that's like fuck all that stuff (laughs) like sleep in fucking who cares it doesn't matter. <laughs> like, do what you want. Do that what's fun. Right, Life is short. <laughs> Eat whatever the fuck you want. Sleep with whoever you want. Do whatever you want. It's fine. Everything's fine. It's fucking good. <laughs> I almost think there's actually uh, maybe Jenny and Dave would like this. The, the, there's a middle path between those two voices. <laughs> yeah. That I think is the answer. <laughs> yes, a hundred percent. Somewhere in there. Um, yeah. You had mentioned service last night when we were talking, and and I hadn't really thought about service as one of these, but I was thinking through it this morning. Like, service could probably be another key component of a recovery life, right? Like this idea of, I think service for me is is the f- friendly, frequent reminder that all my actions should not be for Jason. Like, if nothing else, that's what service does for me. Keeps me kind of in this this mindset of like, oh, some of my life is actually supposed to be doing stuff for other people too. Okay, that's that's good to remember. Yeah, and I, I just, I believe service has a huge connection or it helps us feel a connection to others. Mm-hmm. It helps us recognize, you know, that we are a bunch of people trying to live and exist together and it Mm -hmm. feels good it just it feels nice to help people like when you do a nice thing for someone i don't know too many people that do a nice thing for somebody like god damn i can't believe i helped that fucking person (laughs) you know that you help people out of anger yeah i don't think it's that i do think there's a lot of times when i'm doing shit for somebody and i'm like this is not why the fuck did i even agree to this like this isn't what i want to be doing like, I, I will do it out of obligation a lot of times. I'll agree out of obligation. And then when the moment comes, I'm like, I should have never agreed to this. This wasn't right for me yeah. to be doing this. I have to say, I wonder if that would be service or something else. I mean, yeah. I don't know if service requires or, or is yeah. a well, part I think of service or is it is people good. pleasing. Like, yes. is service yes. people pleasing? Like, are those the same well, thing? <laughs> I, I think there can be some a lot of crossover. Like, service yes. done because I want to step up and help a cause or a need in the world, that's beautiful. And I love doing that. And like you said, I always walk away feeling better about that. But there's times when I agree to service and it's not because I want to, right? Yeah. It's still some of that that you might not like me if I say no. So and I don't, and now that you say that, I'm like, well, I have, you know, a regular commitment, a service commitment that I have through 12 step fellowship and I'm not always excited to go do it and a lot of times I'm like, oh, why the fuck did I say I would do this again? Yeah, <laughs> like, and I feel like I'm not uh, the right person. I don't feel for like that. doing that. And so, but then I go do it and it's like, yeah, this is giving back and at this particular time right. it's a reminder for me of like, hey, I know, you know, these are people that are here that are struggling, that are trying to get their lives together. And if I can have it, it's almost like this podcast sometimes. It's like if I can just be a small part of assisting someone else in helping their, you know, life get better, that's beautiful. You know, and and this is where, and and I'm not, this isn't a right or wrong, just one of those things that my brain goes to think about, right? Like in my mind, if we're all doing the best thing for ourselves, it works out all around. And I'm like, Maybe if this isn't the best thing for Billy, he's actually holding this spot that somebody that would have, I don't know, 18 months who would be really pumped and enthusiastic to step up and help would be way more like enthusiastic to the people he's going in to speak to and everything. And he'd, he'd, you know, have more time because he's at more meetings. He's hearing more speakers. He's got more availability of people to ask to go in with them. And like maybe they're robbed of the position because you're holding on when it ain't fitting you and you're trying to make it like, you know what I mean? Like almost if you would do what was good for you, which was saying, I don't think this is really benefit me anymore. It gives the role to somebody or room for somebody else to step up who it might benefit. Yeah. When this current situation, there are some open positions. So if those people show up, uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, but I get what you're saying. You yeah. can do that in, in different levels of service, whether it's in your home group or whatever else, if you're holding a position. Well, it's, it's just been fascinating for me to try to think through this idea of like, cause I, I, I'm trying to, where's the downfall to me doing exactly what's right for me? Where does this not benefit others? Where does this harm people? And like most of the time when I'm looking at it, don't get me wrong. I can come up with ways it could possibly harm people, 
but I can come up with ways where it would possibly benefit people. And I'm like, why am I always assuming that what I'm doing is going to hurt everybody? And I got to make sure I do it the right way to not like that. Just well, maybe like that depends on your point. attitude of service, too. So I kind of always have been lucky, I'll say, to go into like I don't. I, I haven't personally went into like areas of service and been like, I want to do this. Mm. So you need to give me this position. And then if I can't get that position, I go, well, fuck you guys. Then I don't want to be of service. <laughs> I show up and I be like, all right, what's needed? Where do right, we need help? Right. All right. What what's going to be the biggest benefit? OK, I can do that or no, I, I can't do that. So I guess in the context of. You know, yeah, maybe I'm holding that position from the person that's decided that that's the only fucking position that they can do. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that they're coming in with the best attitude. Well, I so. was <laughs> no, no, I got you. I was thinking more of like the area services. And I feel like I've sat in so many of them where this thing happened where it's election time. Nobody steps up for a position. The person who's already been holding it for the last year is like, look, I'm not keeping this. I'm going to step down. And it's not until three months after they step down when everybody's like, oh, my God, we don't have a treasure. Who's going to yeah. do it? And then and then like more uh, energy gets put into finding a treasure. Right. More people leave that area. More people talk to members of their home group. More people are like, hey, we, we need a treasure. Somebody step up. And then it's found. And I'm almost wondering, like, that same scenario, like, maybe, okay, there's only two open positions, but maybe if there was five open positions, somebody would have a freak out and go out and find people and bring them in, and then they'd have, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. And in some positions, that's the case. Right. Uh, my experience in H&I, hospitals and institutions, <laughs> that's not the case. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> what ends up happening is the person who's in charge has to do it four times instead of three other people stepping up. <laughs> I feel like every time somebody steps up, that eliminates the possibility of anybody ever making anybody else step up, though. Yeah. That's like where it happens. Um, Just being cognizant of time here, I know we're, we're pushing our time. I want to make sure that I mention therapy, or what we often refer to as outside help, um, has been a game changer for my life. Not to say that I'm always constantly in a state of being with a therapist, but since I've started, I don't know, 11 or 12 years ago, um, you know, a couple years on, a couple months off, a couple years on, whatever it takes. Like, you know, there, there's breaks in it and all. But the the information I've gotten there um, and the ways it has helped me and, uh, you know, assisted me in moving forward and, and the parts of me that I feel like it's addressed that maybe I, I'm not saying the steps don't address, but I couldn't get there through the steps, whether that be because it was too painful to do or I, I don't know why. Um, but man, therapy has been a huge piece of my life. And, and, you know, obviously because I became one now too, that <laughs> right. uh, definitely feeds more into it. But I, I think that's also expressive of how much of an impact it had on me, right? It, it, even in the first couple of years of therapy changed me so much that I said, holy fuck, if this is available for people, I want to help them find it. Like more people need to be helping people find this kind of relief because this is amazing. And just thinking of that, like it's been a, a huge and crucial piece of my life and, and my recovery. And I, I don't know that everybody feels that way, but just it, it definitely is at this point in time. And I would say for quite a long time now. I don't. Yeah, I haven't had that experience of individual therapy. Um, and I'm not saying it couldn't happen, but I just haven't. Mm -hmm. That hasn't been my experience with that. My wife and I have gone to some like couples counseling, marriage therapy stuff and that's been super beneficial mm -hmm. just having almost like a mediator or somebody right. to help direct us through communication issues and stuff like that right. but i mean for me personally i've found stuff at different 12-step meetings or support groups or self-help books or podcasts you know that have been as helpful and then and i most say all that to what you say, got there. like most of the self-help books and and then the, like a lot of that's probably also what you would have got. Like you probably right. already had all the stuff they were ready to give. Yeah. <laughs> and then I say all that to say, I actually have thought a lot about, I need to find a therapist that does what I mm. want to do with a therapist, but with insurance and limitations, that's been a, a fucking hurdle. So right. uh, that yeah, I haven't yeah, been willing to suck. jump, you know, it does suck. but it's like, ideally I'd be certainly open to like, Hey therapist, this is what I think I need help with. This is a person I would like to go talk to, but finding that person that also takes, Takes my insurance and all that has been it, I haven't been able to do it so so with us getting short uh, uh, have we mentioned all the ones that were on everybody's list what are, what's missing no. so I have one more and it's kind of I had it as two but I'll combine it and just say um, maybe call it like building a life hmm. that was worth living 
um, was really big for me in early recovery. So, um, and I think there were two main components to that. So one was I went back to college or I went to college with four months clean. Mm -hmm. I started college and I always felt like that um, feeling in early recovery of like, I'm doing something to improve my life. I'm working towards something as opposed to like, you know, I got a job at McDonald's and, and I'm just going to work this McDonald's job for the next five years and not see any like growth or movement forward. That feeling of like I'm working towards something and I'm improving my life and my prospects and my future was was really important to mm. not feel like stagnant. Mm -hmm. um, and then also having fun in recovery, because when I used, I did not have fun. I yeah. was getting yeah. and using and finding ways and means to get more. So being able to you know, have people to do things with on a Friday night or go out to eat or mm -hmm. have money to go to the movie, like just finding fun in recovery. Right. Um, those Huge. kind of things yeah. Yeah, were really big great, great for me, big. especially coming in as a 20 year old. It was like yeah, I needed, absolutely. I needed, I had nothing. Mm -hmm. I had nothing and I needed to build something that was worth saving basically. I didn't think about the fun piece, but I, I remember at some point talking about how crucial and important all the the events that na were putting yeah. on were right yeah. and not so much the dances i'm not much of a dancer but they would have cookouts and you know whatever football games softball and it was like that stuff was huge to know i could go out and just have a good time yeah or even just having friends that would get together for sporting events right. where it wasn't centered around using or drinking or whatever <laughs> a buddy would host a super bowl party or whatever where you would right. all go hang out and just have fun and enjoy yourself well, I was talking to my eight-year-old in the backyard the other day. We were playing, and he was talking about these games they get to play in school. And I was like, man, you don't get to appreciate that as you move out of school time, you don't generally have enough people around to have pickup games of any of these things you're talking about, right? right? Like, <laughs> like, you can't have pickup awesome 10v10 dodgeball games or, you know what I mean? Like, you just don't have that many people around. And, like... The, the the program the fellowship does provide a space where like that, that does exist you can have five people randomly up at one in the morning ready to play spades on coffee and you know <laughs> right. what i mean like you don't find that in your day-to-day -day life a lot huh? yeah and i know guys that have like poker games they do once a week or just right, different things right. where Anything. yeah yeah that's so cool and I, it's interesting you talk about the building a life part right because i'm almost like in my mind that's a part that maybe doesn't matter as much and yet i feel like it's part of the process of getting that to realize that wasn't the solution that was so crucial to my recovery right like i i had to go through the steps of man i need to get the wife the kids the car the the career the house the white picket fence and it was actually the process of acquiring those that made me realize that that wasn't what was going to actually I thought that was going to be the answer at one point right. and it, when it wasn't, but I couldn't have got there without doing it. You know what I mean? So it was like crucial to keeping me there and focused. And yet at the same time, ultimately not as crucial as I thought. Well, I think it's, it's not necessarily that it has to be some like society's expectation of what a, the American life is. It's, mm. it's building a life that you're not willing to decimate or sacrifice for using again. And right. that can look different for everyone. I mean, for me, it wasn't marriage or kids. I didn't do any of that stuff. I still haven't done the kids thing. I didn't do the marriage thing for 12 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like, it was just building a life that was worth living because I was not, I wasn't living, I was using. Um, and so that was, again, that was college. That was fellowship and meetings and friends and fun. And um, so it wasn't, as serious as like oh i have to have this like career and you know all that stuff yeah, but i don't think at any point in time it felt like that in my head and yet that's where i ended up right yeah. like uh, along the way it was just like no i'm just making the right decisions for the next right thing in my life but then i got there and i was like oh i did that thing where i got all this stuff that society tells us to get and i'm still not happy huh yeah. <laughs> like I didn't know I was headed there and yet that's obviously where I was headed because yeah. that's where I got I mean and I wanted those things right I just right. didn't accomplish it <laughs> I didn't accomplish it Failure. So. <laughs> <laughs> um I, I don't know I guess we had to wrap up here people probably aren't listening anyway at this point but uh, <laughs> if I had to say there's one most important thing that could help like if I listen to this episode and I'm like oh fuck I'm not doing any of those like I, I'm fucked tomorrow <laughs> right Get one person 
that will hear you, that can hear you, right? If you have nothing else, in my mind, if you have nothing else and shit hits the fan and there's a person you can call that you know you can tell them whatever's going on and you're going to feel safe and they're going to respond with some kind of compassion and love, I think that is the most important thing we need. Because if we had that, then we at least, in my mind, don't want to leave this world. And that's like the best starting point, I guess. Yeah, connection. That connection is crucial. Any final thoughts? All right. Well, go out there, do your best practices, whatever they are. Maybe hit us up with your top three list and uh, tell us all the ones we forgot about or couldn't fit into this hour plus. And uh, have a good week. Did you like this episode? Share it with people you think might get something out of it. Check out the rest of our episodes at recoverysortof.com. Also, while you're there, you can find ways to link up with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, YouTube, anything. We're always looking for new ideas. Got an idea you want us to look into? Reach out to us. <laughs>